When was the first time DMT was ever used? Was that 50s? 1956 was Stevens art. Well, when we say DMT was first ever. Well, the first time he ever like like wrote a report about what he experienced. Right. So pure. When we talk about pure DMT, people have picked me up on this, but I am correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember YouTube comment actually. Um, yeah, nineteen. YouTube comments are fake. Those people aren't real. Okay, that's good. It's computers, right? It's all Iranian yeah, bots. It's, yeah, <laughs> chat bots again. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So nineteen fifty six, Stephen Zara. So there's, a, there's an interesting story, uh, kind of leading up to this point. Is it starts it really in eighteen fifty two? Do you know Richard Spruce? Nope. Well, he was a peerless British botanist of his time. He was the most famous and probably the most important botanist in history, Western botanist at least. Um, he was exploring the Amazon. He was con contracted to explore the Amazon, to, to find new plants and then to identify them, often name them because they didn't have names, um, at least not Latin binomials. And then he would send them back to, the, to, the, to England and collectors, very rich people would you know, frame them or whatever and put mm. them in their, their drawing rooms and that mm. kind of thing. But as soon as he entered the Amazon for the first time, he couldn't help but notice that all of the the natives around there, they're all using drugs, right? Is this guy still alive? 1852. Oh, never mind. No. <laughs> I need not answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he noticed straight away that they were using all of these different drugs and like powdered coca leaf. He saw them stuffing their cheeks to bursting with these powdered coca leaves and um, these weird pellets and potions and uh, liquor, various type jungle liquors mm. and cassava beers and all of this kind of stuff. They yeah. love drugs, basically. Um, and he was invited to this uh, party, I guess you would call it, a periodic gathering called a Dabo Kuri. This is in uh, 1852, a, a group called the, the Tucano uh, by the Valpes River. Um, and he went to this party or this gathering and everyone was singing and dancing and people were drinking cassava beer and uh, consuming like powdered coca leaf, etc., etc. And then he sort of, he started to notice something unusual happening, which was, which was that the men would periodically, they, they'd kind of peel away from the dance um, and then they would, they would drink this weird liquid. Uh, and then they'd start kind of acting very, very strangely. They'd start howling. They'd start. They'd pick up weapons and start beating the earth with these weapons and stuff. It's like they were fighting some invisible adversary of some sort. Mm. Uh, and he didn't know what was going on. Um, and this happened throughout the night. You know, at every point in the night, there were at least kind of half a dozen men engaged at some phase of this performance, if you like. Um, and, and he asked them, you know, what was that liquid? And they said it was called carpy. Uh, and he tried a bit, but it was absolutely disgusting. And he, he basically almost vomited. Uh, so he didn't get a full dose. Um, but he was told, OK, the, the plant used to make this carpy, the carpy vine, uh, is located downriver. So the next day he went downriver found this, this liana twirling around this tree and he named it Banisteriopsis carpi, the ayahuasca vine. Banisteriopsis? Banisteriopsis carpi. Wow. That's the name of the vine. Okay. And so then there was like a century of scientists trying to understand how does this because they were describing their experiences as well. They would describe these terrifying beasts that were kind of trying to seize them and stuff and beautiful cities they would describe and mm. all this wonderful visions they would describe after after consuming this carpi, also known as ayahuasca in other other regions. Mm -hmm. um, and then a century followed, people trying to isolate the alkaloids and no one knew how it worked. It wasn't until like the 1950s until people realized, and William Burroughs was heavily involved here. He, he heard about carpi, also known as yahe, um, this was when he was living in Mexico City, shortly after he shot his wife in the head, accidentally. Oh, yeah, I read about that. He yeah. shoot something off the top of her head, like a can or something? Yeah, exactly. A glass. And he put a bullet through her brain and killed her instantly. So he was struggling, I mean, obviously, with guilt, and um, he was looking for the final fix, as he described it. So he went off. I mean, this was like this gangly, kind of lanky 
tweed jacketed writer to s- decide I'm going to set off, go to the Amazon, and I'm going to try and find Yahe um, because he'd heard, read about it in a magazine or something. I mean, what a world that must have been, right? Where people do that kind of thing, just setting off into the Amazon. Uh, and he, he happened to meet Richard Schultes, who was like the world's leading expert on Yahe or ayahuasca. Um, and he went from shaman to shaman, kind of asking them for this drink. And every time he drank it, he just vomited a lot. Nothing particularly interesting happened. Um, and he couldn't work out what was going on. Uh, until I think it was like the third time that he tried this uh, Yahe. And he had these, this mag- he was transported to another world. And he was like overwhelmed. He thought, yes, this is it. I mm. finally found the copy, the Yahe that I was looking for. And he was led into this trade secret by the shaman. The shaman said, okay, yes, the carpi vine goes in there, but there's another leaf we put in, a secret leaf, uh, which has to be put in together with the carpi vine. You boil it up and then boil it down till it's mm-hmm. thick and syrupy. And when you drink that, then you, uh, you get the, the, the kind of the, the magnificent visions. Uh, and he even pocketed samples of this secret leaf mm-hmm. and sent it to Richard Schulte's Richard Schulte has ignored it because it came from some American writer. He didn't think it was that important. Um, then, like a decade or a couple of decades later, Richard Schulte's student, Homer Pinkley, um, was working with this indigenous group. And again, he saw them using the carpi vine, the ayahuasca vine, Banisteriopsis carpi, together with this other leaf. So the two components, they realized, two kind of a binary decoction of, of two essential yep. components. Uh, and Homer Pinkley identified it as Psychotria viridis, Chakruna. Um, and when they uh, analysed this leaf, Psychotria viridis, Chakruna, they found lots of DMT. Um, so that was kind of the breakthrough, which is always... Homer Pinkley is always given the credit here, but actually it was Burroughs because Schultes went back to the letter that Burroughs had sent him with the sample of the leaves and he realised that Burroughs had in fact sent him the correct leaf. It was Psychotria viridis. So Burroughs actually, William Burroughs, author of Naked Lunch, is actually, should be credited as being the the kind of the, the person who made that breakthrough in understanding how um, how the, the 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 key psychoactive component of ayahuasca that should be given credit really to William Burroughs. He didn't name the plant, of course. He didn't know how to do that, right. but he identified it. Mm. But then, of course, there was still kind of a mystery because by that point, Stephen Zara had shown that if you swallow DMT, which he'd done at first, mm-hmm. uh, nothing will happen. Right. So the <laughs> idea that this was the primary psychoactive component of a visionary drink didn't make any sense. And then there was the carpi vine. You know, what, what was that for? Why was that in the mix? No mm. one had any clue. Until um, Dennis McKenna, really, Terence's brother. Yep. I mean, he was really one of the, the key figures in working this out because by that point, people started to understand that the carpi vine contains these harmala alkaloids, harmine and harmaline. Um, and it was kind of worked out that these harmala alkaloids, they're inhibitors of this monoamine oxidase mm-hmm. enzyme, um, which is found in your gut and throughout your body. And it was also then beginning to kind of be understood that DMT is broken down very rapidly by this monoamine oxidase enzyme. Mm. So when you swallow DMT, it's very rapidly broken down, mm-hmm. never gets to the brain. Right. But... So the hypothesis at that point was, when you add the harmala alkaloids from the ayahuasca vine, Banisteriopsis carpi, and inhibits it. So you have here a true pharmacological technology. Mm. This wasn't just a mixture of plants. This was a technology employing pharmacological synergy. You have the inhibitor of the monoamine oxidase and you have the DMT. Only when you take them together do you get... Um, the effect. This is called the ayahuasca effect now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Dennis McKenna worked on this hypothesis and Dennis McKenna received samples of ayahuasca and he showed that you could take samples of the ayahuasca brew and it would inhibit this enzyme um, showing that 
the the ayahuasca brew contained you know sufficient harmala alkaloids to inhibit right. the monoamine monoamine oxidase in your gut which right. allowed the psychedelic drug to take effect yeah so so from the very beginnings you you this is why i always talk about dmt as being a a technology uh, because very, from the very beginning, humanity has developed technologies, and mm -hmm. ayahuasca is a technology, yeah. um, to uh, uh, as tools, technologies as tools that allow you to interact with normally unseen hidden intelligences. And that's what these spirits of the forest, the hekuda, the mm. wat warusinari, these are intelligences that you normally can't see, the hidden ones. Mm. Um, and they develop these tools, these technologies, to make them visible. It's like a visual prosthesis that allowed them to see these intelligences. And then when we kind of move the, the dial forward into the, the, the 20th century, you know, we, we learned how to isolate DMT and we learned how to use it, uh, pure DMT, first by injecting it intramuscularly, then by vaporizing it, Nick Sand, very famous LSD chemist who also mm. was a DMT manufacturer. He discovered one day he was being particularly careless in his lab and some crystals of DMT fell on a hot plate and it, it, it like a puff of white smoke or white vapor, should I say. And he thought, well, can't we just smoke this stuff? Because everyone had been injecting it yeah. to this point uh, intramuscularly as well which is kind of a very erratic and drawn out experience. And so Nick Sand realized, oh, we can, we can vaporize this. Um, and then in the 1990s, Rick Strassman says, well, vaporizing it, it's a bit messy. It's hard to measure doses. Um, it stinks, mm. it's irritating to the lungs. So I'm gonna inject it not into the muscles, but intravenously directly into the bloodstream. Um, didn't Dennis, or didn't Terrence give him that idea? Oh no, Terrence gave him the idea to get government funding for it, the study. Yeah, so the Terence McKenna, yeah. yeah, so Terence McKenna was, so this was after Rick Strassman. He was still a young um, psychiatrist and mm. he, he was interested in melatonin at first, but he right. wasn't interested. And then he went to this conference where he met Terence McKenna yep. and, and and he was talking about DMT. Rick Strassman was in his talk and Terence McKenna came afterwards and says, you're talking a lot about DMT, but have you ever tried it? That's bad, Terence McKenna, but you get the point. <laughs> um, and Rick said no. So Terence kind of sent Rick to the big house at Esalen. This was at Esalen. Uh, and then Terence kind of went away and f found someone mm. who had DMT and brought it back. And that was Rick Strasman's first DMT yeah. experience. Um, and that was the kind of the genesis, if you like, of his long bu bureaucratic process that led to him being given permission to do this, the largest study of its kind in human volunteers. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. They tricked the government. It's exactly. so fucking smart. And so, so I, you can kind of see this thread of going back perhaps thousands of years of humanity d discovering DMT or discovering how to use DMT, even when they didn't know that they were working with DMT and developing technologies um, uh, um, to kind of to how best to use it. You know, how do we, how do we develop this as a technology? Um, is vaporizing it the, the culmination, the pinnacle of DMT administration technologies? Of course not. Is it intravenous injection? Maybe not. Uh, and this, then this finally leads, well, not finally, because I'll talk about the future as well and what we're working on now, but leads to DMTX. Mm. Right, you have this very short-acting experience, which is very intense, but only lasts a few minutes. And what DMTX does, or extended state DMT, is allows you, as we were saying right at the beginning, to extend this. So I see that as just simply the next iteration of uh, uh, of humans learning to use and develop DMT as a technology. <laughs>